Welcome everyone, my name is Elizabeth Olson, Head of Growth at Xverse, the leading Bitcoin wallet for Web3 with first class support for ordinals. You can download it on your phone right here now. And I'm joined here today with a rock star panel uh, to discuss VC, institutions, research, all of the above through the lens of ordinals. So to kick it off, let's go ahead and start with a round of introductions about, about yourself and your project. Trevor. Hi everyone, I'm Trevor Owens, managing partner of the Bitcoin Frontier Fund, and we invest in outstanding early stage startup teams building new use cases for Bitcoin. So we're super excited about ordinals, of course, BRC20s, ORC20s, SRC20s, uh, everything, stamps, counterparty, anything that is wild and crazy and has uh, solves a problem in the market and has a solid team behind it. You know, we like to be an early check uh, to help you get off the ground. So uh, great to be here. Hi, I'm Nick Carter. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. This is the only conference I'll be speaking at this week. Special no thanks to Bitcoin 2023. <laughs> <laughs> um, I run a, a fund called Castle Island Ventures. We invest in Bitcoin. I'm a Bitcoin moderate, a Bitcoin pluralist, and uh, we invest in the ordinal space and general Bitcoin technology. I'm Alex Thorne. Uh... Hello. Oh, there we go. I'm Alex Thorne. I'm head of research at Galaxy Digital. Um, been in uh, Bitcoin for a long time. Used to run uh, Crypto VC at Fidelity and was head of blockchain research there. Um, overlap with Nick there a little bit. Um, and we, I mean, Galaxy's, um, you know, it's a multi-services financial company, investment banking, asset management, trading, ventures, mining. And some of our mining team is here. Shout out to BZ over there. Um, we love ordinals because it's it doesn't harm Bitcoin. We wrote a big report about it. Me and Brandon and some other folks on our team where we did some market sizing we're going to talk about. But... We think it's not bad for Bitcoin and is also very possibly excellent for Bitcoin. So um, that's what we've been doing. We cover it from a research standpoint. Hey, folks. Christopher Berger. Um, I'm general partner at Gossamer Capital, uh, principally focused on investments in uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, general decentralization. Um, thrilled to, to be here. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, really, really glad to, to, to be a part of this. Wonderful. All right, so to kick off the conversation today, before we dive into ordinals and even, even uh, Bitcoin, would like to get your assessment of what's going on in the U.S. with, uh, with regards to the political landscape. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is rallying an anti-crypto army. Tradvise, underwater, uh, we're seeing these, uh, the U.S. trying to implement these regulations to eliminate uh, crypto systemic risks, at least perceived ones, and I uh, would like to take your, uh, get your take on the, uh, what's going on here and, and your assessment of, of these risks. Um, Chris, perhaps you can start us off. Sure. Well, first let me say that um, before this began, I posed this question to the group uh, in hopes of getting like, some insight from other smarter people than me. So let me first just give that disclaimer. Um, but so I, I have a legitimate struggle with kind of addressing the Bitcoin space as, you know, this, this tool to create and build and generate wealth and the kind of the dichotomy of, um, you know, using it as this tool to kind of generate freedom, okay? And, you know, Bitcoin, unlike other uh, environments, really sort of straddles that, that kind of space. You know, it's a it's this amazing, uh, you know, it's this amazing ecosystem, and there's all of this, there's, there's all, um, sorry, there's all this wealth to be generated, um, but it's also this incredible tool for freedom, and that is, you know, obviously, sort of this systemic threat to, um, to kind of the, the, the existing power structure, the status quo, and so, you know, um, what we're looking for in, in companies who are, are sort of trying to straddle, they are building an innovative protocol, but also, you know, trying to kind of use the underlying beauty of Bitcoin in, in creating kind of, you know, this egalitarian sort of um, utopian uh, outcome uh, you know, is really maintaining commercial agility with, you know, proper due diligence, proper organizational structure, 
um, so that they, you know, if, if things really get bad, there's, there's opportunities to pivot, there's opportunities to be, you know, be adaptable and malleable. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Alex, did you want to add to that? I know you've been in, in the trenches in regards to, to research and assessing the, the scenario, so we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, for, I mean, from a regulatory standpoint in particular, I would say it's very, um, yeah, I think Bitcoin's pretty safe in the scheme of things as, an, as a, its own protocol, right? It's not really the place where DeFi uh, rug pulls happen to the tunes of billions of dollars, right? It's not, um, it's the only asset that Chairman Gary Gensler says is not a security, right? So there, there's some, in a way, Bitcoin um, isn't sort of in the crosshairs of most global regula regulators. However, the industry that supports all Bitcoin and the, all the rest of crypto is absolutely um, struggling with either a lack of clarity or overt negative pressure from governments. Um, and yeah, I can see how, you know, trying to, you're looking for a tech investment, but also the founders are like libertarian freedom fighters. Um, it's, it's an interesting overlap here, right? Because um, actually Senator Loomis said this really well, I heard her say, she said that the reason that we want uh, to promote things, for example, like stable coins, is that we want to protect American power and the dollar. But at least while we do that, we're also building up the industry to support a decentralized global financial system. And if the dollar goes down, then we'll lead on Bitcoin. Like it's sort of Bitcoin's the hedge for the dollar, right from the senator's mouth. So I, it's an interesting dichotomy. They sort of kind of want both, and and it's like you try to ride the wave until they one overtakes the other. And but hopefully you're in good position when that happens. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and speaking of politics, uh, we all know Ordinal certainly caused a lot of controversy in the ecosystem. Uh, but at the same time, we saw a whole new wave of artists and builders and talent and investment come to Bitcoin, which has been fantastic. People are having fun again. Several of you up here are taproot wizards. Uh, so Trevor and Nick would love to hear how you think Ordinals have improved Bitcoin culture, and, and perhaps why, why is there still so much pushback? Why is there still that tension? A few things. So first of all, uh, actually not to answer the culture question, security budget, ordinals, uh, they don't fix it, but they are directionally taking us in a place where we have more sustainability. And unless you're blind, that's a concern. That's a long-term concern for Bitcoin. I think anyone that's intellectually honest has to acknowledge that that there needs to be fee pressure in Bitcoin in the long term. Culture-wise, Ordinal's brought an influx of new developers into Bitcoin, and the more of these folks join Bitcoin, the less influential the voices of the puritanical fundamentalists are. So they're just simply outnumbered now. Um, and that allows us to shift from this regressive, anti-technology, conservative stance to a progressive stance where we actually embrace building new things on Bitcoin. We don't treat block space as this pristine wasteland not to be transacted on, but a place where you actually make economic transactions, which is the point of Bitcoin. Bitcoin block space isn't meant to be a desert where no one ever does anything. It's meant to be used. It's, and, and there's this kind of like moralizing we hear from the purists, which is, look, block space should be empty. It should be one sat per byte. No one should ever use it because we have to protect the ability of the global south to transact, should they ever want to. Um, we have to protect my ability to transact cheaply, even though I'm not gonna make any transactions, if I one day want to, <laughs> when I refresh my multi-sig 10 years from now, I want it to clear one sap per byte. So don't use Bitcoin. Don't use Bitcoin. That doesn't make any sense. Bitcoin will not survive if that is the dominant attitude. So to me, the most important thing is altering the culture and simply bring in this new fresh air, which we're seeing. Um, and it doesn't matter what the substance of the ordinals is. All that matters is that people are excited about developing things for Bitcoin, building L2s, building marketplaces, using PSBTs, using Taproot, using these new protocols. All these things that were implemented in Bitcoin are now actually being used for the first time by the ordinals and inscribers, which is deeply ironic, but you know, it's an incredible development. So. I can't be happier with the status quo here, the fact that it's changing. Yeah, I have to say I agree there. Um, Trevor, what are your thoughts in regards to the, this cultural shift and, and block, uh, block space congestion? I think, I think Nick had a, a fantastic answer. And I'm not a tapered wizard yet. I'm just Udi's number one reply guy on Twitter. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think like 
you know, when I came into the, the space and, and saw like the toxic maximalism, it was very strange to me. It seemed like there was a lot of cognitive dissonance there. And I think my stance has evolved a little bit to where I think that maybe the root cause of this is not necessarily like pure ideology, but more even just politics. One of the interesting things about the Bitcoin ecosystem is that it's super decentralized. And so if you compare that to like Ethereum, Ethereum actually has a foundation, it has a founder. There's sort of like a directional like allocation of like, this person has authority, this person is smart, you know, this is a good idea. But in Bitcoin, you don't have that. We have like a free for all. We have many different ecosystems, many different companies, many different applications. And so of course you're gonna have more politics in Bitcoin, but I think it's important, number one, uh, is there, are there any engineers in here who say they like love politics or they love, you know, like that's something they like to, that they're good at or they enjoy? Probably not, right? And so I think that's definitely goes against like the culture of building, it's a distraction. And I think it's important for people to recognize that, that, hey, maybe like what, I'm, what people are saying has a motivation behind it and not necessarily like specific intentions or even like a well thought out logic to it. Like we have to be uh, skeptical of like not just uh, um, people in a different tribe than us, but also people in our own tribe in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And we need to be open to like fostering, uh, you know, coopetition, for example, having frenemies. We can all work together, even if we have different incentives and interests, and still make Bitcoin more successful. And so we got to be careful about looking at players in the ecosystem who have like a, I just want market share and I'm happy to like burn down like kind of the goodwill in the space or the collaboration in the space to gain more market share. We have to be focused on trying to get politics out of this and really focus on building, letting a lot of experiments and like a million flowers blossom because that's the only way we're going to discover how we can onboard the next you know, billion users to Bitcoin is by lots of experiments, by a focus on building, not a focus on like, oh, this solution might be better than this solution. Okay, then ship it, let the market decide. Don't talk about solutions, ship them, put them out there, let's see what happens. Let, um, you know, talk positively about different options, you know, don't attack each other. We are not against each other, we are against the legacy system, and I think it's important to remember that even if, you know, Ethereum is not against Bitcoin, like the legacy system is against it. It's a good thing that Bitcoin has an Ethereum, it's a good thing that Ethereum has a Solana. We're all trying to move the space forward. And I think with ordinals, I think with the new culture, you know, that's something that I think is part of the core values of like, hey, we can disagree with each other, but we're also not gonna like, you know, uh, go like hit below the belt and try to like destroy people just because they disagree with us. Let's encourage everybody to build. Let's let the market decide. And, um, you know, let's not fall victim to those, uh, those like stale ideas of the past. Absolutely, this is um, such a, pivotal moment in, in Bitcoin history, not only in Bitcoin history, but, but even beyond Bitcoin, we're just seeing an incredible bridge from other ecosystems, people coming to Bitcoin, uh, and also within, within the ecosystem itself. Um, sorry, Chris, did you want to add to that as well? Just on the, the cultural piece, you know, so uh, the Bitcoin is, is kind of like this, uh, you know, Humans have this this wonderful tradition of, of burning libraries and rewriting history, and uh, that's been going on for you know as as long as time. And you know, Bitcoin is now basically this 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 ledger that can't be tampered with, this library that that humans can't really interfere with the the historical you know context, the story anymore. And you know, what Ordinals does is it basically took. A, ledge, a library that could only, you know, sort of store calorie shells, and now it can store books. So, I mean, that's the level of innovation. Yes, it's primitive. Yes, it's new. But that's, the, that's like the cultural, you know, level of innovation that's happening, you know, on this chain right now. I mean, it's phenomenal. Yeah, just, it's just wild. Um, great to see, see books like somebody was just saying my earlier panel, 1984, the Bible's on there, and we're just seeing the greatest uh, artifacts of human history now, now come uh, to Bitcoin being scribed forever and ever. Um, so Alex, I, I wanted to ask you, I saw Galaxy came out with a pretty comprehensive white paper around inscriptions and ordinals predicting a $5 billion market in the next two years. So how did you come to that number? What's your uh, methodology around that? Yeah, we just totally made that up. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> f five billion is fun. I'm just kidding. I know Trevor small, was saying I was small. being bearish. Um, you're, you're, our, you're, why are you fighting us, Alex? <laughs> Um, no, yeah, we did. By the way, we uh, wrote that. We started. We almost wrote that. Like, we started writing that paper in like early February. So, like, I mean, around like like sub 10k inscription count, 
We didn't finish it until I think the very beginning of March. It was already at 700,000 inscriptions, and today there's over 7 million of them. So um, we basically just did some simple, like, you know, venture triangulation here. We said, like, what market does this look like? Well, it looks very similar or could. I think actually could be even much different, but at a base, it could look like the Ethereum NFT market. So we looked at how NFTs grew on Ethereum, how long it took them to grow. What, and when we say the size, I literally mean the aggregate value like of NFT collections. We, didn't, we weren't modeling trading volumes or other types of things that might spring up around them, right? But just like if we took all of the Ethereum collections, like you go to, um, you know, like CoinMarketCap and click NFTs, and we just sum the value, right? Like board apes are like $4 billion or something, or, right? Which is like, what could ordinals get to? We said $5 billion, uh, um, by two years from then, so March 2025, I think that was that was our base case. We said that would um, it would become massive for luxury generative art, um, a lot of one of ones, um, historical collectibles. We said, and even this estimate had limited PFP projects and limited utility projects. And part of the reason we thought about it this way was, while it, it, you know Bitcoin can, is being used for this, can be used for this. But Ethereum at all are purpose built for tokens, right? Like ordinal theory is a second layer social consensus. I think it's working great. I think every, it is going to be the way people use inscriptions. Um, but you know, for like a utility coin, token gated stuff, right? It's just not really the same as like a token that the consensus protocol knows about, like on these other platforms. But it absolutely, Bitcoin is the most. Uh, decentralized. It is like a digital stone tablet. You're talking about the Bible, 1984, right? Like, so that's why we like one of ones. We think it's we think it's luxurious. It's more expensive block space. It's higher fidelity. Um, we think. Um, I mean, you had Yuga's 12 fold uh, mint is a great example. Like, we, and when I look at, um, you know, you you have what punks and apes are like valuable PFP projects, but most of the other valuable NFTs are generative art or or beautiful artwork. And I think we think. Uh, building into our basically it was like a pretty solid capture of that part of the NFT market with a little bit of NFT uh, P, like PFP projects and stuff like that too. And so that is it is a pretty like limited base case. Like if if it goes beyond that, I mean our bull case was like we'll call it double twice as much of that happens, right? It was like ten billion. But um, yeah, we we actually did try to. There's more to the methodology than just that. But it was really looking at we did stuff on timing and how long it took. ETH projects to get XY valuable, and which we apply multiple to that because that already exists. So, um, but yeah, we think it could be big. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, especially with the luxury adoption there, I think it's fascinating to see uh, how quickly luxury companies are, are coming to Bitcoin. We're seeing already Bugatti, uh, once their collection's fully minted, it's, it's going to be the first, probably the first blue chip NFTs on Bitcoin. So, super exciting uh, to see this adoption. And Trevor, did you have any? Any further thoughts around the, the valuation of, of Bitcoin NFTs or NOLs? Yeah, I mean, I think yesterday we saw um, Bitcoin frogs, Ribbit, by the way, for any of the frogs out there. Uh, we saw them pass um, Board Ape Yacht Club in daily volume. So um, Bitcoin frogs had, I think, 2 million in daily volume. I think Board Ape was 1 million. And so if you look at uh, CryptoSlam.io, we're actually seeing a lot more analytics and tools. Shout out to Lunar Crush as well, now analyzing BRC20s. Um, uh, CryptoSlam.io has a ranking of like volume of NFTs, and Bitcoin is solidly number two behind uh, Ethereum. And the, 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 like, Ethereum is like down 10% as of like the last seven days, and Bitcoin uh, is up like 60% of the last seven days. So uh, it's... There's a, there's a lot of room to grow here, I think, in this space, and that's why it's exciting. That's why I feel like we're in a bull market right now. You know, when you're in the ordinal space and you're deep in it, it's like there's multiple announcements every single week. Uh, there's, you know, always something to talk about, and, you know, it feels like we're in our own little, um, you know, bull market. I mean, so. the market infrastructure has exploded. There was nothing like three months ago, now there's tons, right? Like the marketplaces, the wallets, right? It like, wasn't on a roadmap before. It's like, it's like incredible though. I was like, yeah. I've been blown away by the speed at which the ecosystem builders are building out the infrastructure for it. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah, it sounds like with the infrastructure coming, the, the demand building in the, in the market, we're definitely going to see a need for scalability solutions. So um, yeah, what, what do you think is, is the solution here? Nick, I'd like to hear from you, you know, uh, in regards to challenges or opportunities we might see in regards to, uh, yeah, L2 possibilities? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's if you look at it closely, what happened on Ethereum, um, as block space gets more expensive, you know, high prices are the cure for high prices, right? So mm -hmm. as the commodity gets more expensive, you become more efficient in terms of how you insert data. So if you look at generative art, actually, I would say like there's a, you know, a good number of uh, artists and programmers on Ethereum that have figured out how to compress image data into just lines of code. So I would say that's probably where we're going with Bitcoin. If fees stay very high, people will begin to use some of these tools to just reduce the imprint. I know right now people are obsessed with creating four megabyte blocks and like really showing that they can you know, spend and bloat the chain. Um, ripping four megas. Ripping four megas, yeah. So you know that, that's like a prestigious thing is to consume a lot of block space, right? But what's actually gonna happen is people will figure out how to compress data and uh, represent whatever it is they want to represent on the blockchain in as few bytes as possible. So be parsimonious, right? So that, that's how all payment systems scale, right? You, uh, you want a small settlement transaction to represent a lot of deferred payments elsewhere, and it's no different with NFTs. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, so you know, I don't think we really have anything to worry about in terms of like capacity limits. If prices are high, people innovate and figure out how to compress data. Um, more generally, though, I think the scalability push in Bitcoin in general as a payment system is totally augmented by the existence of uh, ordinals and inscriptions because it is a regime change in fees, right? Fees will now be structurally higher. I don't know if BRC20s are going to last. Um, that might have been sort of more of a short-term mania in terms of the minting, but either way, we are in a structurally higher fee regime, which is great. And that will cause people to move off chain, actually use some of these L2s. There's now a pressure to use Lightning. You need that economic pressure. And it also increases the urgency to create rollups. I heard on the last panel, let's get a ZK Prover uh, soft fork into Bitcoin. Let's definitely do that. Um, other types of L2s, right? We can take good ideas from the Ethereum ecosystem that understood that you need multiple competing L2s, right? Not just one ordained solution multiple competing ones that open up new design spaces, right? We don't just have one second layer solution for dollar payments. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of ways to send dollars around. We don't just do ACH or credit or debit or cash or fintechs, transfer wise, remitters, Hawala. We have so much stuff to move dollars around. It should be the same with Bitcoin. And so the beauty of ordinals is it creates this economic urgency to actually innovate add these kinds of soft forks to Bitcoin so we can support CK rollups, for instance. So the scalability picture is really exciting right now. I'm seeing a lot of high quality entrepreneurs in that space. I'm excited to back them. Yeah, bullish, bullish, and anyone in particular, I think we all want to know. Yeah, Nick, don't, don't forget to hit me up. <laughs> Not to put names. you on the spot. That's a great okay. answer. You know, Nick, you, you actually, uh, you gave a presentation several years ago called um, Container Ships, uh, Bitcoin is Container Ships, which is exactly your point you're making. It's still true, right? Settling. I just repeat myself. Nothing ever changes. <laughs> but no, I mean, check that out. It was great. I think. Uh, yeah. Trevor? Yeah, I mean, I, so I think, um, you know, clogging is good. That's what I think. And when it comes to, um, like, Ethereum, for example, during, during the, the bull market of NFTs 2021, I spent enough on gas to buy a really fancy new car, okay? You can, you can check my wallet and see. And why did I do that? Because I actually was sending high value transactions that enabled me to like, make much more than what I, I lost from gas fees. And so that's how it's going to work in the future with Bitcoin is that we need fees to go up so that um, the security budget is as high as possible. And the L1 will be focused on high value transactions. So sending things where you need the max amount of security and the L2s will function sort of like a load balancing where over a certain point in, in like minimum fees uh, in the mempool, uh, people will start to migrate to the L2s. And I don't think we'll see significant demand until that, um, that mempool fee gets really high. I think that the number that I'm looking around at is around like 500 sats per V-byte. I think we got over to uh, 600 with during the, the BRC excitement. And you know before ordinals, it was like one sat per V-byte. It was like the minimum that's possible by the code. And since then, we've gone up, you know, to the peak of over 600x, I think maybe we're around like 100, or I've seen around 50. Um, and so once we get to those levels, which we will get to soon, especially by the next bull market, we will almost certainly be in like levels that high that are at least 10x from here. 
And um, that's when the, the L2s are gonna come into uh, the conversation. I think that this is the natural uh, evolution of things. I think that there's a lot of different approaches, and I think this conversation is gonna be super exciting for all of us to see um, what solutions people come up with. I think the interesting thing about how ordinals will tie into the L2s is like, in my opinion, like the, the, one of the innovations is that we're seeing like assets on L1 that don't have smart contracts. And so we may see a separation between a functionality and smart contracts on L2s or, or you know, implemented in a different way where the actual BRC20s, the ordinals, represent sort of uh, like individual or dummy assets without the smart contract logic that they can be wrapped or plugged into those smart contracts because actually having assets without smart contracts, number one, makes it easier for people to publish them. So if you, if you want to like launch a token, launch an ordinal, an NFT, you don't need a developer to do that. That makes it so much, uh, so much easier and lower barrier to entry. It also makes it better for the users because there's nothing fancy that the developer can do with the smart contract where they can like remove the token from your wallet or they can like essentially rug you. And so I think this actually is an interesting innovation that's come out of the necessity and the constraints of building on L1 is that we will see, I think we'll continue to see assets on, on L1 because you want to have that flexibility to store them there. And then these assets plug into Bitcoin scripts so all the trading is done through like the highest level of security uh, with Bitcoin L1. But I think, of course, we needed a different virtual environment for advanced smart contracts. And so I think that will happen most likely on L2s. Or we'll, we'll see how far the node software, uh, sorry, smart contracts implemented as node software as opposed to on-chain logic. That's the tagline that I actually uh, read from uh, Joe Looney, one of the counterparty developers, when he was talking about ordinals. I think it's an interesting paradigm, but we'll see how far that can take us beyond the current like, level of simple indexers that we have now. Yeah, definitely. And I know we just have a minute left, but I do want to ask Chris one question. And real quick, how many, how many people out here are, would consider themselves ordinals entrepreneurs or a business related to ordinals? Yeah. Um, so so while, while you're up here, can you give us some advice around, um, you know, when you're listening to a pitch, what's that, what's that turnkey moment? Uh, what are some green lights that you look for? Uh, so for, you know, for this, for, for you know, a, a primitive like this, there's there's sort of you know this this kind of uh, speculation era where we don't really know what to do with these assets, so we're just going to kind of trade them back and forth. Um, and then there's sort of this there's sort of this uh, uh, you know this realization of utility, okay? And that that's really like to create you know the use cases that are that are going to make that, that are going to you know take Bitcoin and make the best use of block space. Um, you know, the utility question, which is to say also like scaling and layering, you know, taking, taking those kind of execution environments, the solution to, you know, how does that ordinal, uh, you know, inform, you know, a, a broader sort of set of, of contracts or agreements, um, you know, in, in a really kind of beautiful, immutable way. Um, you, know, having, ha you know, having a founder that really understands sort of technically how to execute you know, and build in that utility for sort of the, the next generation of what, what ordinals are going to be in this, you know, in this environment. That's, that's going to be the most important thing for me. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, any, any closing thoughts on, uh, that yeah, you have to leave um, with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I just, I do think the, the culture clash that is occurring between, you know, this, um, a refreshing builder um, atmosphere that, like Nick pointed out too, is, and Trevor, is like a, a lot of focus on L2s, on scaling, on using Bitcoin, by the way, in ways that you are absolutely allowed to use it. Nobody can tell you uh, what to use Bitcoin for, and these are all valid Bitcoin transactions. So I don't know how people can be upset about using Bitcoin. I'm happy there's a lot of new people excited about Bitcoin because, like, you know, to Nick's point, right, there's, there's a strain in, in the Bitcoin culture that actually believes, like, using Bitcoin is a shitcoin. Like, to use it is a shitcoin, right? It's like, you, yeah, you can only use Bitcoin if you don't use it. Right? <laughs> um, I think that's very stupid, and I'm really excited for everybody that's building new interesting stuff on Bitcoin. Nick, closing thoughts? Look, Satoshi believed in digital artifacts, okay? Yeah. Look at the Genesis block, for God's sakes. Look at the biggest ordinal hater, Luke Dash. In 2011, he put Eligius Versus onto the Bitcoin blockchain. I support that, okay? He supports that, right? Bitcoin has had digital inscriptions on it in one form or other since day one, since literally day one, January 
2003, 2009. People have been trying to stuff arbitrary data into Bitcoin through various mechanisms the whole time. It's been there. It's not just since we had inscriptions or normals, okay? This is a highly available database that has extremely strong data assurances in perpetuity. People are going to put interesting economic, non-economic data on it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. Um, and there's nothing to worry about because the market will cure the bloat, right? Uh, and we're still operating within the defined rules. So what's happening now is just that we open floodgates to innovation. It's solving the security budget. It's changing the culture. People are finally using Bitcoin again. I don't think you can complain about that. It's not going back. Trevor, yeah. closing thoughts. Awesome, Nick. Yeah. Uh, we can't grow Bitcoin by excluding people. We can only grow Bitcoin by including people and growing the space. And so I think let's lead by example. Let's be like the coolest community. Let's welcome people. Let's have fun. Let's be positive. Let's throw things out there and build and ship. And let's just do that, guys. Let's have a good time. And let's show people what, uh, let's make Bitcoin magical again, as the, as the wizards say. And hopefully Udi will give me one someday. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Um, Thanks, everyone. <laughs>